Can you open the door, please? They're breaking in! I got you, baby. Your family must choose to willingly sacrifice one of the three of you to prevent the apocalypse. We're not choosing anyone. We're not sacrificing anyone. Not now, not ever. Even if I believe the world was at stake, which I don't, that's what it means. I will ask for the last time. Will you make a choice? Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explain. As requested, today we'll be exploring Knock at the Cabin, the 2023 post-apocalyptic thriller written and directed by M. Night Shyamalan, based on the novel The Cabin at the End of the World by Paul G. Tremblay. Starring Dave Bautista, Rupert Grint, Jonathan Groff, Kristen Q, Ben Aldrich, Nikki Amuka Bird, and Abby Quinn, the film revolves around a family whose holidays are pended by a cult. The film, to me, even though it has these huge themes, it's very hard to answer what it's about. For me, it's a love story. It's a love story between a family. So you go from like a survival story, which immediately grips the, the audience, to a kind of a moral, ethical dynamic. All of Knight's films kind of, um, I think, encourage their audience to challenge their reality and what they believe in. I think it's like, yeah, I think it's a really good m movie to watch for where we're at in the world. Told they need to sacrifice one of their own to prevent the end of the world, the thriller has them and the audience question whether the invaders were lunatics or messengers of truth. Much like the rest of M. Night Shyamalan's filmography, the backbone of the movie is intrigue and mystery. A group are faced with weird supernatural circumstances and are forced to make tough self-revelatory choices that go on to define them and, occasionally, the world around them. Part of what lured the director to the project is his fascination with the weird and unexplainable. Ironically, as we'll discuss in this video, that didn't stop him from taking certain liberties that traded the ambiguity in the novel for more explicit themes and iconography. The guy loves his symbolism. In this video, we're going to explain the narrative, the main characters in the story, and how the film differs from the novel. Much like the novel, the film opens to seven-year-old Wen catching grasshoppers outside of a remote cabin. While in the source material, her family leaves their home in Cambridge, Massachusetts for a cabin in New Hampshire, the movie has them in rural Pennsylvania. Showing an inquisitive mind, she tells the creatures to relax, explaining she was only going to study them shortly before releasing them back into the wild. As Wen jots down observations about the insects, the girl spots an enormous stranger with thunderous footsteps approach from the distance. Saying he was not from around here and that he wanted to make some new friends, he slowly approaches before asking if he could speak to her. Using her wit and quick thinking, Wen tells him that she doesn't talk to strangers, but is disarmed by his acknowledgement that she is right not to talk to strangers. Finding out her name is Wen, he reaches out his hand and shakes it, telling her his name is Leonard. Offering to help her with the grasshoppers, the tattooed giant delicately catches one and places it inside the jar. Learning that she wanted to help animals when she grew up, the man also discovers that she had two fathers, Andrew and Eric, who were inside the cabin making breakfast. With Leonard looking over his shoulder worryingly, it's clear that despite the ominous circumstances, he means her no harm. After Wen tells him that she was about to turn eight in six days, Leonard reaches into his pocket and pulls out a flower, offering it up as a gift. As the two get to know each other better, he learns that it took a lot of doctors to fix the deformity on her lip, something that she's sensitive about. Leonard then admits that his heart was broken because of what he had to do, before looking over to three other strangers that approach with weapons. Questioned if they were his friends, Leonard reminds her that she was also his friend, something he does not want her to forget. Admitting the strangers were working for him, he tells her that they had a very important job. In fact, he believed it was the most important task ever appointed to anyone. As the girl walks back to her cabin, Leonard tells her that while her family had done nothing wrong, they have to make a terrible decision. Explaining that her parents would not want them to come in, he gently tells her that she must convince them to let them in, otherwise they'd be forced to break in, something he wants to avoid. Finding Andrew and Eric in the backyard, she screams at them to come inside and locks the door before telling them there was a group outside with weapons. Assuming them to be vagrants, the pair ask the strangers to leave, but are told that was not possible. Although Leonard insists that they should be proud of the kind and thoughtful daughter they've raised, his insistence on being let in infuriates the pair. Leonard explains that the four of them, Adrian, Sabrina, Redman and Leonard, have been compelled to arrive at this cabin and speak to them. Saying they're here for a difficult conversation and a chance to save a lot of people, they start to freak the family out. When asked why they have weapons if they just want to talk, but is dismissed by Leonard, who tells her that they were merely tools. Unlike the others who have a calmer demeanor, the hot-headed Redman threatens to barge in. Wanting to hold them back and protect his family, the equally hot-tempered Andrew then threatens to shoot them if they do, before admitting to Eric that he left his gun in the car outside. Realizing they had no signal, 
and that their landline had been disconnected by the cult, the trio get to work locking the doors and windows around the cabin, all while the cultists look for another way in. With Sabrina entering through the kitchen, Eric tells Andrew to get Wen outside before attacking her and falling on his head. Despite Sabrina then saying she was a nurse and immediately attempting to tend to his concussion, Andrew forces her to back away. Seeing the angry Redman entering through a broken side door and furious by the attack, Andrew beats him to a pulp. With the others then breaking in and Leonard picking Wen up, the man is ultimately forced to drop his weapon and allow the grip to tie them up. Of course, from their point of view and the eyes of the audience, this is a terrifying home invasion. While it technically still was, there are more layers to the story which we're about to uncover. Just like the novel, the film has Adrian, Leonard, Redman and Sabrina stating that they'd never met before this fateful day. Although they claim to directly have no intention on harming the family, the group admit that they've been compelled by visions and an unknown power to find them. Strangely, Adrian, Leonard and Sabrina begin undoing the mess they made, while Redman glared at everyone from the corner, hinting at their true nature and purpose. After Leonard cleans up the broken glass, Adrian tries to fix the broken doors, and Sabrina bandages Eric's head wound, each of them explains who they are. Showing he was a complicated character, Leonard points to a cartoon they turned on to calm Wen down and highlights his observations. The characters in story give him the sense that its message is empathy and tolerance. Taking offense, given the fact that he was tied up, Andrew posits he was not in a position to talk about those values. Pushing back, Leonard calmly explains that he was not here with hate or prejudice in his heart, something that Adrian and Sabrina attest to. He then tells them that they were normal people like them, but didn't have a choice. The furious Andrew disagrees and believes that there was always a choice. Conceding that he was right, Adrian tells him that their choices define their destiny, a mantra that she almost got tattooed on her body in the past. Admitting this was true, Leonard then tells him that they made the choice to come here before telling the others it was almost time. With Andrew violently trying to break free of his restraints, Sabrina takes it upon herself to explain her background. She's essentially a post-op nurse from a small town in California that used up all her savings to prepare for this day and arrive here. Struggling to contain her tears, Sabrina tells him that she had a half-sister back home that Wen reminds her of. Saying that he was a second grade teacher from Chicago, Leonard then jumps in, explaining he runs an after-school program and that he also worked as a bartender. Interjecting by impatiently slamming his weapon down, Redman then sarcastically tells him that he likes long walks on the beach and drinking beer, but is told that they deserve to know who they are by Leonard. Arguing back, the agitated Redman tells him that they'd already wasted a lot of time waiting for Eric to regain consciousness, and that getting to know each other didn't matter given their task. But Leonard pushes back, pointing out that when he speaks in this manner, he's terrifying the family. More than that, he's making it less likely for them to believe their story or cooperate. Conceding their leader was right, he reveals he works for a gas company in Massachusetts, essentially making sure that homes don't blow up. Searching into his past, Redman also admits that he did time in prison for crimes he now regrets, before pointing out that his father used to beat him, the same way that Andrew had just done. Believing there were a cult about to perform a ritual, Eric tells him they're not going to join them or change their views. With the man then complaining about the light, Sabrina tries to get them to take it easy as he was still concussed, prompting Redman to work on covering the windows. Finally, Adrian steps up and introduces herself. Explaining she was a line cook for a Mexican restaurant in DC, she reveals her passion was feeding people, something that gives her life meaning. Looking down at Wen, she tells her that she had two cats to go with love named Riff and Raff. But before she had any time to say more about herself, Leonard looks down at his watch and turns the TV off, saying that it was time. Much to the family's confusion, he tells them that the four of them were here to prevent the apocalypse. They essentially think that they can stop it from happening, but only with their help. Whether the world ends or not will ultimately be decided by the three of them. Taking a knee, the Hulk somberly tells them that their family must willingly sacrifice one of their own to avert the apocalypse. If they fail to choose or follow through with a sacrifice, the world will essentially end in a series of cataclysms that Adrian, Leonard, Redman and Sabrina have all seen in their visions. This can only be averted if the family kills one of their own as a sacrifice. But if they refuse, the family will live on to watch the world and over 7 billion people around them perish. As we discover, the strangers aren't as evil as we initially thought, but representations of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. For some context, in the Bible, the first horseman is a conqueror with a bow and crown that rides a white horse, often interpreted as pestilence. The second has a great sword and rides a red horse, symbolizing war and bloodshed. Riding a black horse, the third carries a balanced scale and symbolizes the inevitability of famine. Identified as death, the fourth horseman is said to ride a pale horse. 
Instead of the traditional interpretation of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, each of the four seen in the film represent four distinct qualities of humanity. Malice, nurture, healing, and guidance. Redman is the embodiment of malice and wears a red shirt, just like the description of Orr in Revelations, who rides a red horse. Disagreeable and impatient like his namesake, he is a product of his violent and dysfunctional upbringing. On the other hand, the others are more like inverted versions of the traditional horsemen of the apocalypse. For example, wearing a pale yellow shirt, Sabrina is the personification of healing. She is essentially the opposite of death, the most famous of the four horsemen, who is described as having a pale horse. Wearing a black shirt, as the embodiment of nurturing, Adrian is the mirror reflection of the apocalyptic figure riding the black horse named Famine. Of course, instead of starving people, the mother and cook use food to help others. Finally, we have the gentle giant of a man, Leonard, who represented guidance and wore a white shirt. Although Leonard is analogous with Pestilence, the white horse ridden by the first horseman, the Book of Revelations said that the rider came out conquering to conquer, leading many to imply that the rider is actually a manifestation of conquest instead. Despite being a leader that mirrors the first horseman, instead of conquest and domination, something that he's more than capable of, Leonard chose to lead through guidance. This leads me to believe that both the novel and film are loose interpretations of the Day of Judgment, with Wen, Eric and Andrew called upon by a higher power to both do the judging and also be judged. It's based on a book by Paul Tremblay, which we were actually familiar with, and the idea, the high concept was so compelling tonight, and that started the process. So as he wrote it, he fell in love with it, and we decided, let's, let's go make it. This, this would be the next night movie. Leonard explains that the four of them cannot make the choice for them, act on their behalf, or allow one of the family members to simply take their own life. First, the cities will drown. The oceans will swell up and rise up in a great fist and pound all the buildings and people into the sand and drag everything out to sea. Then a terrible plague will descend and people will begin writhing with fever. The skies will then fall and crash to the earth like pieces of glass, before finally, God's finger itself will scorch the earth, bringing everlasting darkness on humanity. Crying as if being forced to say the words against his will, Leonard states that for every no the family gives them, each of these plagues will be unleashed upon the world for the sins of humanity. When the family refuses to choose, Redman breaks down and covers his face with a white cloth as his associates stand beside him. In this moment, Eric sees something shimmering in the mirror, and while we assume it is merely sunlight, we later discover it's a vision of when grown up. Stating that a part of humanity has been judged, the cult execute Redman with the weapons they crafted, much to the shock of the family. Sure enough, when Leonard turns on the television, we get a brief infomercial cameo featuring M. Night, followed by catastrophic news. A devastating earthquake that hit the Aleutian Islands triggers a massive tsunami that hits Hawaii, Canada, and North America. While the initial broadcast states that the early warning systems allowed most people to escape, a second earthquake triggers a mega tsunami with waves that were over 50 feet tall. Recognizing the footage from their vision, they all look on as the giant waves claim the lives of millions. Giving them a moment of reprieve, Leonard tells them they will rest for the day and have the time to think everything over, while the group tended to their every need. Furious by the intruders, Andrew tells him that the rest of the world can die, but given the vision he had seen of his daughter, Eric begins to change his mind. Amidst the chaos, we see flashbacks of pivotal moments in the lives of Andrew, Eric, and Wen that came to define them. On his guard due to being a victim of hate crimes, Andrew refuses to believe them, stating this was an orchestrated attack against the pair. His suspicions are fueled even further when he claims to recognize Redman as the very man that went to prison for attacking him. In his mind, they were all targeted for revenge. While this makes the group question the motivations of their fallen horsemen and grapple with their own guilt, they hold on to the revelation of their visions. Remaining steadfast, they reveal that while Redmond's death and the death of the millions swept up in the waves temporarily delayed the apocalypse, the family needed to make a choice once again. When asked by Andrew if he was okay, Eric then says something incredibly profound, that his ears were ringing, but his vision was clear. More than just a comment on his current physical state, he's alluding to the fact that although he's having a hard time believing this story, he believed in the vision that he saw of when. It should also be noted that while Andrew tried to discredit Redman, he was genuinely unsettled that the man allowed himself to be killed to reveal the magnitude of the apocalypse. Still, with the family refusing to harm one of their own, after she feeds their daughter and admits that she also had a son named Charlie that liked pancakes, Adrian is the next to be judged, along with another part of humanity. With Leonard turning on the television once more, we learn that a deadly plague called X9 that specifically targeted children had been unleashed, killing hundreds of thousands of kids. 
Despite this, Andrew says the intruders were actually using pre-scheduled news broadcasts to trick them. In fact, the human rights lawyer points out that both of the major events were already happening, or in the midst of happening, when the four horsemen had left their homes. Pushing back, Sabrina describes how she and the others were led by their visions to find each other and carry out their seemingly random mission, like they were compelled against their will. And she's not wrong. You see, the four horsemen are both harbingers of the apocalypse and victims of it. Each of them represents an aspect of humanity, and as an aspect of humanity, they've come to the cabin to present themselves for judgement. As they see it, one of them is obligated to die, each time the family judges a portion of humanity not to be worth saving. Though it seemed like they had all the power, they're actually begging for their lives, and the lives of the people they loved. And of course, the only way that they and humanity can be spared is by the family being tested by God, and making an unimaginable choice. With Eric distracting Sabrina and Leonard, Andrew manages to untie his hands and retrieve his gun, using it to scare Sabrina into running away. Realizing the tires of their car were slashed, Andrew suggests that they find the vehicle that the four horsemen came in, and locks Leonard in the bathroom. With nothing left to lose, Sabrina runs back into the house and is fatally shot by Andrew. Tricked into coming into the bathroom, Andrew fires a shot into Leonard's arm, but is ultimately overpowered by the behemoth. Sacrificing the injured Sabrina, the final horseman turns on the television, and they're all shocked to learn that over 700 planes have begun falling from the sky around the world. With their time almost up, Leonard freakishly recounts the next news broadcast, word for word as it happens. He then takes him to the deck as the skies blacken and lightning strikes begin to scorch the earth, signifying the everlasting darkness of God's wrath. Crying as he told them they had minutes to decide after his death, Leonard finally sacrifices himself. With the frequency of lightning strikes and plane crashes around them beginning to rapidly increase, Eric admits that he now thought they were indeed the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Not wanting Len to grow up in a ruined world without hope, Eric offers himself as a sacrifice. The vision he saw earlier was of a future where the world was okay, and a grown-up Wen was still being taken care of by Andrew. Importantly, it's because he was gifted this blessing of seeing her future that Eric offers himself up. Accepting his choice, Andrew reluctantly shoots Eric and stands back with his daughter, as a lightning strike destroys the cabin and all those that perished inside. Not only do Andrew and Wen find the truck the four horsemen arrived in, but all of their belongings corroborate the stories they told them about who they were. Driving into a nearby diner, the pair are relieved to hear news reports confirming their sacrifice had averted the end of the world, with the extreme weather event subsiding. I'm very drawn to stories of confinement and telling very large stories through a small window. It just takes you on this journey of your imagination, You're just going to the worst places, but I think that's what makes it terrifying, that feeling of being unsafe. When discussing the changes he made from the novel, Shyamalan explained that he chose to call the film Knock at the Cabin, instead of Cabin at the End of the World, out of respect for the author. Speaking with the writer, he told him some of the many changes he was planning on making, most notably to the ending, and was pleased to discover that Paul had many of the same ideas. In fact, he'd initially written the same hopeful ending as the film, but opted for a darker resolution. The Cabin at the End of the World plays out at a blistering pace, with its events taking place over the course of one frightening day. The movie follows the novel very closely, but starts to differ from the moment that Andrew retrieves the gun. Adrian is also still alive at this point. While Andrew shoots her in the book, a struggle with Leonard over the gun also accidentally leads to Wen getting shot. Devastated by this, Leonard agrees to be tied up but explains her death will not count as she was not a willing sacrifice. Eric's visions also play a bigger part in the book, guiding more of his actions. In the novel, Sabrina also appears to give up and kills Leonard, before offering to lead Eric and Andrew to safety. The third death still leads to news reports of unexplained plane crashes around the world, but it's then revealed that Sabrina still fully believed in their mission and was actually tricking them. Like Leonard in the film, Sabrina ultimately tells the couple that there's still time to prevent the apocalypse before taking her own life. The biggest change, however, comes in the ending. Eric offers to be sacrificed, but without when and the hope of a vision, Andrew refuses to kill him. Ending with the pair heading to Redmond's car, carrying the body of Wen, the resolution of the novel doesn't actually give us a definitive conclusion over whether the apocalypse is real and inevitable. In fact, it leaves it up to the reader to make up their own mind and determine if the intruders were telling the truth at all. Baffling, intriguing, and filled with the build-up of tension that M. Night has mastered and occasionally lost over the years, Knock at the Cabin is a thrilling interpretation of Judgment Day. 
Do you really think it's all just a coincidence? Yes, I think it's all coincidence. Some horrible, unexplainable coincidence. I have to believe that! With that said, that's all for today, folks. A huge thanks to everyone that requested we explore Knock at the Cabin in full. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. And if there's anything else you'd like for me to cover, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film and Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by. Drop it now, Leonard, or I'll kill you! You're dooming your husband. You're dooming your daughter. I'm done with you! I'm not listening to another goddamn word you say! Always together. Always together.